It's in Revelation chapter 21. And it begins with verse 1. I'm reading this from the New American Standard Bible. So if you have the Pew Bible or your own, it might be a bit different. But please follow along. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. Yeah, today I want to talk about, it's probably the longest title I've ever written on a sermon. Skip the seven wonders of the world. Who cares? Show me the seven wonders of heaven. There's probably a whole lot more, but I'm going to share seven with you today. Let me start this way. There was a a couple Sundays ago, Dr. Julie was, uh, she was teaching the second grade Sunday school class. And uh, she was talking to them about the wonders of heaven. Uh, They listened with rapt attention as she described the details of the final chapter of the book of Revelation. And when she finished, she turned to her class and and she said, how many of you want to go to heaven? (laughs) Every hand shot up, except for one little boy. Bobby didn't raise his hand. So Dr. Julie assumed that Bobby hadn't quite heard the question, so she asked it again. How many of you want to go to heaven? And again, every hand shot up. Except for Bobby's. Yeah, so Dr. Julie asked directly, Bobby, Bobby, you want to go to heaven when you die, don't you? And Bobby looked at her and said, of course, of course. But I thought you were getting a load of kids up right now. And I missed my ride home last Sunday and my dad said, I better get right home after Sunday school or else. Let me ask you a question. You want to go to heaven, don't you? Of course you do. But not everyone does. And for a lot of different reasons. Some think it's too boring. Mark Twain didn't do us any favor when he wrote about Huck Finn. Huck Finn rejected any real interest in heaven by saying, all a body would have to do is to go around all day long playing their harp and singing forever and ever. Younger people sometimes deny any interest in heaven for that reason alone. They tend to think that they're going to live forever is another. Older folks know better. A little girl once asked her slightly older sister why her their grandmother always read the Bible so much. And her reply was, I think she's studying for the final exam. Those who are wiser think about heaven sooner rather than later. You see, life has no guarantees. All you have is right now. You have no guarantee that you'll be here on the face of this earth tomorrow. So today I want us, for those reasons, just to look at this sermon and this title. Skip the seven wonders of heaven, of earth. Give me the seven wonders of heaven. First of all, what we probably need to do is we need to define the word wonder. What does wonder mean? Well, let me put it in the simplest terms that I possibly can. When you wonder about something and it's a wonder, it it makes you wonder. 
I know that's not much of a definition, but it's the best one I can give to you. It's amazing. It's spectacular. It's marvelous. It makes me wonder how did that happen? Or how could that be? So let me give you seven wonders that I think and I see in Scripture. Here's the first wonder. The wonder of heaven's existence. I mean, this is what the Spirit revealed to the Apostle John about heaven, according to the book of Revelation. Seed after seed flooded before John's eyes over and over again. And it's as hard as John tries to tell us about heaven using this human language. He just couldn't do it justice. There's not enough words to define the glories of heaven. There's not enough words to describe the beauty that lies there. This is a place that's not made by human hands, never wears out. Its inhabitants are too vast to number. Its streets are of gold and its walls are of jasper. There's no hospitals, cemeteries, prisons, or mental institutions. There's no crime, pollution, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, or earthquakes. Think of stepping on a shore and finding its heaven. Think of taking hold of a hand and finding its God's hand. Think of breathing new air and finding it's heaven's air. Think of feeling invigorated and finding it's immortality. Think of passing from a raging storm to an unknown calm. Think of waking up and finding it's heaven. See, actually, Revelation emphasizes more the size of the city than the individual residents in it. Uh, But a big city means that there's a lot of space for lots of people. This new Jerusalem that the Apostle John names, he he describes it as a cube. It's 1,500 miles wide. It's 1,500 miles long. It's 1,500 miles deep. That's hundreds of times bigger than the biggest man-made metropolis. The numbers are more figurative than literal. They're exploding our minds when it comes to its vastness that it's an enormity beyond what we could ever imagine. The foundations are marked with jewels of untold value. Bible scholars are actually unsure of the identity of some of the precious stones mentioned. Civilizations have used different terms for such gems through the centuries. Single pearls. One pearl. It it takes up a, a gate. There are 12 gates in this beautiful city. The streets are paved with gold that's so pure it's almost transparent. Crystal pure water flows through the city. Parts of the scenery sound like a garden or an oasis. The descriptions intentionally evoke images of the Garden of Eden. There was a little girl who was out walking with her daddy late one night. Wonderingly, she looked up at the stars in the heaven and she said, Oh, daddy, if the wrong side of heaven looks this beautiful, what must the right side look like? Here's wonder number two, the wonder of its character. You see, it's a place of incomparable beauty. Paul tells us, well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has the mind conceived all that God has prepared for those who love Him. It's a place of purity and holiness. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall come into it. It's a place without sin. And therefore, without sin's consequences, there's no war, there's no hatred, there's no crime, there's no disease, there's no punishment. It's a place without sorrow or sadness or death. It's perpetual joy and life. In heaven, we all receive new bodies. The aches and the pains will be gone. Disease and suffering will end. No more cancer. No more Alzheimer's. No more arthritis. Limbs weakened by strokes will be restored. Eyes blinded by diabetes will see again. All of the disabilities and limitations of this decaying, aging, finite body will be gone. Listen to how Paul described this in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. This is from the Message Bible. This image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere stretch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind that when we're raised, we're raised for good. Alive forever. The corpse that's planted is no beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. 
put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body, but what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality to when it's raised up in spiritual immortality. Don't you think that explains why the exclusivity of heaven? How much evil would it take to spoil a place like this? Only those who have been cleansed Not perfect, but those who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, made fit and ready for heaven, will ever enter it. Here's wonder number three, the wonder of the throne. The main thing about heaven is not all the glitter and all the gold, all the smells and all the bells and all the whistles. It's the one sitting on the throne. It's the presence of God. Jesus said, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. In that same chapter, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And he will come and we will come to him and make our abode with him. It's one thing if someone were to rent a motel room for you to stay in while you were visiting. It's an altogether another thing, matter, for that person to open their home and say, just come stay with us. In heaven, the Lord of glory opens his home and says, come live with me. The Bible always describes heaven in such personal terms. That's what makes heaven, heaven. Not gold and jewels, but the very presence of the heavenly Father himself. Listen to Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have all passed away. Which leads us to the fourth wonder. The wonder of heaven's joy. Jesus tells us in Luke 15 about the joy in heaven. He says, I'll tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Then again he says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now you know why God so loved the world. That He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Wonder number five. The wonder of who is there. As one elderly believer wrote, As a boy, I thought of heaven as a city with domes, spires, and beautiful streets inhabited by angels. By and by my little brother died. And I thought of heaven much as before, but with one inhabitant that I knew. Then another died. And then some of my acquaintances. So in time I began to think of heaven as containing several people that I knew. But it was not until one of my own little children died that I began to think I had treasure in heaven myself. After after another went and yet another By that time I had so many siblings and acquaintances and children in heaven that I no more thought of it as a city merely with streets of gold but as a place full of inhabitants. Now there are so many loved ones there I sometimes think that I know more people in heaven than I do on earth. Imagine Being reunited with departed loved ones, parents, grandparents, friends from years past, a spouse, children who died before you. Heaven will be a grand reunion for the redeemed. The great hymn writer John Newton said that when we get to heaven, there will be three wonders. The first one, who is there? The second one, who is not there? And the third one, the fact that I'm there. Wonder number six, the wonder of who's not there. You see, this is God's prerogative. Not befitting for us to all get energized about who's not there. The Bible makes it very clear. Not everyone will be there. 
John 14, Jesus 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Revelation 21, 7 says, And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abominations and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven's exclusivity is a problem for some. Somehow they've come to believe that the doors of heaven will be flung wide open and any are going to enter. And yet the Bible tells us differently. Someone once said, a man may go to heaven without health, without wealth, without fame, without a great name, without learning, without culture, without beauty, without friends, without 10,000 other things. But he can never, ever go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Which leads me to the last wonder, the seventh. The wonder that more people don't prepare. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. It's an open invitation. It's for each and for all. Whosoever will may come. You see, the ticket has been paid for in full. Do you have your ticket in hand? Of, out of all the questions in life, make sure that you have that question answered. Do you have your ticket in hand? You see, reservations are still available. They're still available, but there's going to come a time when there will be no more reservations. They won't be taken anymore. And you must have your ticket to get on the bus. Listen to me. There are some choices you don't get to make in life. You don't choose when to be born. You don't choose when to die. You don't choose to enter eternity. But the choice you do get to make is where you'll spend eternity. Will you pray with me? Father, so many times we read of heaven, we think of heaven, we attend funerals. We think it's a beautiful place that you have created and made ready for us and prepared a home for us. And yet, we'd probably much rather wait to get there. And yet you've opened the door for us through the cross, through your Son, who paid the eternal price. And even he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. From the beginning of time, he's created this place. Help us live with heaven on our mind. Help us live with a destiny in place. Help us live yearning to be in your presence forever. I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. Thank you, Jesus, for opening that door. In your precious name, amen.